Hello, welcome everyone. I'm so glad to have you here today. Um, today we're going to be talking about mapping resources and building community. If I can have you go to the next slide there. The title slide. Uh, we'll go to the next slide here. Uh, today, Joshua and I will be presenting. Um, my name is Michelle Vance. I'm in Oak Harbor, Washington. I work as a program specialist for Youth Move National. I've worked with Systems of Care and Healthy Transitions Initiative in Utah. I also ran and started the first Youth Move Utah statewide chapter a few years ago. Um, I'm here today with you all because I believe that youth voice can change the social service system. Um, I believe that um, people and youth have a great potential to fix a lot of problems for themselves and for their peers um, with the proper access and education, um, also given proper opportunities. Um, thank you for having me today. I'm really happy to uh, join this work. Next, I'll have Joshua introduce himself. Hello, everyone. My name is Joshua Calarino. I go by he, him pronouns. And like Michelle, I believe that having youth voice in social services is going to be a great boon uh, to the entire world. Um, I live at, in Miami, Florida, where I'm calling out from, and I work at Youth Move National as the youth program coordinator. And I am just very happy to be here and very happy to be able to share some of my knowledge and expertise around things like chapter management or FISPERT management in these cases. But I was uh, in large part uh, a big help, so to speak, to a Youth Move Miami chapter uh, or rather the Youth Move Miami chapter down here in Miami, Florida, where I work as just a member of volunteer and also as the lead peer. And with that, I will pass the mic back over to Michelle. Thank you, Joshua. I'll go to the next slide. I'll talk a little bit here more about Youth Move National. So Youth Move National is a youth-driven, chapter-based organization, and we are dedicated to improving services and systems that serve and support youth and young adults. Um, in line with our mission, motivating others through voices of experience, we have united to utilize our experiences and skill sets to affect positive change through youth advocacy, youth leadership development, and youth engagement. We support youth and their community partners in change management, implementation, providing training, technical assistance, and consultation, um, youth and young adult partnerships, leaderships, training, all things youth voice. Um, youth Moves National Chapter Network consists of over 60 chapters across the US, uh, where young leaders are working in their local communities trying to advocate and provide leadership opportunities for young people to be involved in decisions and efforts that impact them. This allows for cross-system, cross-cultural, and very ge geographical representation of youth voice and experience across our efforts. We here at Youth Move National envision a future in which young people are valued as empowered leaders, advocates, and designers of communities that are built for all youth to thrive. Next, I'm gonna pass it over to Joshua and we'll get started on the content for today. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll get started on the content for today. And to begin, we are going to start off with a bit of a definition for mapping resources. And mapping resources or resource mapping can be broken down into two different variations. It's the individual resource mapping and then the larger, so to speak, community resource mapping. So to get our feet wet, resource mapping is an active process to identify, visually represent, and share information about internal and external supports and services to inform effective utilization of resources. Now, that was a big fancy definition, but the breakdown of what is being said here is as individual people, what a resource map can do, whether it is you're a youth, you're a provider, you're just a random person, what it does is you can map out all the resources in your area that benefit you. That can be yourself, it can be your art, it can be your music, right? All those internal things that make you who you are. And it can be your external supports. That could just be friends, could be family, or it could be organizations that you've attended, places that you like to go, clubs you have joined, right? It is a resource of your 
or rather a map of your resources. And the entire intent of it is to make sure that you are using them effectively in your life. Are you missing something here? Are you missing something there, right? How can I, as an individual human being, map out these resources to make sure that I am using them well? And a way to, to measure if I'm using them well or not is through the eight dimensions of wellness. Now, the eight dimensions of wellness is uh, a bit of a chart, a bit of a tool that comes to us from SAMHSA, that's a Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And they have broken down an entire person's wellness into these eight categories that you see on screen right now. So that is physical, emotional, environmental, spiritual, intellectual, occupational or school, financial, and social. And those are really big buckets, as you can imagine. And all of them interlock and interchange and swap from how full or how empty they are, depending on where you are in your life, who you are as a human being, what resources you're using. You could have great physical, emotional, environmental health, but have maybe not so great intellectual stimulation or wonderful finances or even occupational uh need in your life, whether it's maybe you work very hard and you really appreciate the work, but maybe the money isn't so great or vice versa. Maybe you have fantastic money, but the work they're doing is not rewarding to you. Each little bucket has its own intricacies that extend from what I just described and many larger discussions that you can have with yourself. So this is a way that you can use an individual resource map to see what all you can find to help you. Now, to move on, we're going to go to the community resource or asset mapping. So similar to resource mapping, but the goal is of working with a team to build on where and how to find resources in the community to potentially build partnerships. So let's say you work at an organization or you really want to help out an organization to do better work, build more partnerships, find more people like them to offer better services to the youth that are that are there, to the people that are going. You can use a community mapping resource instead of an individual resource. So some of the things that you can do is think about individual people who might fit on a resource map, specifically things like youth coordinators, a local therapist who was helpful, city council members, supportive partners or adults that you might know, and they can fit into this community resource map as partners for the organization that you might be working with. That could be associations and club, an informal group, could be Girl Scouts, could be GSA, etc. It could also be entire institutions. Usually it's nonprofit or public, could be, for example, Youth Move National, shout out there, the Department of Mental Health in your local area, et cetera. It can also just be the local economy, local commerce, local businesses in your area, mom and pop shops, maybe a Walmart, maybe a Publix, who can offer things like in-kind donations or monetary donations, food donations, tons of different ways to be able to leverage that. And then even what you might not think would fit in that, but it can also be stories. What are stories that you can hear from the community? Themes you might feel, themes you might hear, themes that should be addressed, should be talked about, should be navigated within your community. You can ask the question, you know, what are these themes and how can we as an organization, we as a group, whatever you might be, utilize that in the work that we are doing. Okay. So with that, I'm going to show a little bit of an example that we can see on screen here. So what a sample community asset map can look like is what you see on screen, but you can make any variation of it as you want. And you can see the breakdown on the right hand side of our screens here. So that can be the physical space. So what physical space are we using as a meeting? If you have one room to work in and you have 35 people and it's not a very big room, it's going to be really difficult to host groups, to have a conversation. Everybody's pressed up against one another like sardines. So it can be something like, should we move out to 
gardens? Should we go out to parks, playgrounds? Can we utilize parking lots, walking paths, bike paths, picnic areas, or better yet, can we talk to our local partners in the area to maybe be able to utilize their space, ideally free at cost, maybe for a small payment, who knows? Again, circling back to that local economy, what are the for-profit businesses that might be willing to help out my organization? What are certain banks that might be willing to offer something? Credit unions. What are big foundations in my area that are local to my area that are understand the needs of the communities? What are the branches that I can find? For example, you might find a for-profit organization that might have a branch that works in the nonprofit sector and they'd have a really great understanding of the needs of the community and would be able to offer a lot of other resources that maybe you cannot. Or it can be something as simple as associations and clubs. What associations and clubs might align with the mission and vision of the group that you are a part of, of the group that you are hosting? Maybe you're a youth who wants to be a part of a group, maybe you're an organization, but what can align with what I'm doing? And how can I leverage that alignment to make something larger, to make something more connected? could be mentoring groups. Each youth can have a mentor or you as a youth, you can get yourself a mentor on different topics you might like, or it can be a mutual support group, provide a little bit of peer support so that people can hear one another out, foster community, foster kinship and friendship in the local community. And of course, there are just those simple people, like we mentioned, a really good youth coordinator, a really good staff member at that bank who I can call if I really need something. Individual people are kind of what make the world go round. And it's about connecting all of these individuals together that forms a group. So who are some of the best people you can find to make that happen? And of course, like I mentioned in the last slide, those stories. And there are some examples, right? What are some stories of background and the pertinent history of your area? What are the things that the community likes to do, that they like to contribute to? Do they like to speak on and advocate for marginalized community, represent those who might be experiencing houselessness? Maybe they want to speak up about things like avo uh, avoiding animal abuse, et cetera, things like that. These are stories you can get and build that into the programming of your own life, build that into the programming of your organization. So you can sit down and you can really think this out, leverage all that we're talking about right now to get the best result at the end of it. And to provide some deeper insights into, into the questions that can be asked, I'm going to pass the mic over to Michelle to discuss where to find resources. Thank you, thank you. So Joshua, I think just briefly touched on some of these sectors before, but I want to talk about all of the different options um, that we have in terms of, of partnerships. Uh, where can we go to find these resources that we're talking about? Um, so first, we're going to start with the public sector. This includes all of government, right? At a city, a county, a state, or a national, or uh, um, commonly known as federal level. Services that exist um, within these, such as schools, county mental health services, public assistance, um, housing services. This also often includes substance abuse prevention and intervention services. Um, these are really great to partner with, although they are typically pretty formal systems, right? So again, it is really great to know a contact, one person within that that um, you have their ear or at least their contact information, um, really important to build that relationship with them. The private and uh, the private sector, um, this is going to include um, anything that is in the business of making money, right? So those for-profit businesses and services that are owned by individuals um, and also corporations. These are really great places to get donations from. They're really great places um, in terms of looking for funding for different projects and partnerships like that. 
Um, it can be harder to identify, right, just one individual person um, within larger businesses. So it's also a good idea to look at the smaller um, mom and pops, the smaller type of businesses um, to partner with them as well. Um, the not-for-profit sector, again, shout out Youth Move National, um, but this also includes um, uh, agencies like human service agencies, youth agencies, um, those who are in the business of doing social service. Um, this also includes things like art and educational um, organizations, as well as advocacy organizations. Um, not-for-profit sector does not mean that people involved with that work do not get paid. Um, they, they do have paid staff and a board of directors. What it means is that any money made goes back into the work. Um, and it is run by a board of directors um, to make some of those decisions. So that's kind of how you delineate um, a nonprofit from some of the other sectors. An informal sector, this involves all of the groups, all of the organizations that focus on specific interests. So members in this sector are usually not paid. Um, they're there voluntarily on their own accord um, and interest-based. So this includes things like faith communities or churches, sports groups, self-help groups, artist associations. Um, I have on here barber shops and a few other, um, you know, um, kind of niche groups like that. I think that, uh, you know, in my experience, it has been much easier to build partnerships with folks that exist in the informal sector, especially when we're talking about youth or talking about um, making improvements, people really want to give back and they want to be, um, and they're not necessarily provided those opportunities, but when those opportunities are available, I have found that they do rise um, to the occasion. So thinking about partnering with your organization or even partnering with an individual to seek resources, this is a great place, I think, to start because it feels really good um, building those those. Uh, relationships and seeing that be successful. Um, so I would like to kind of open it up for folks in the room. I know someone just barely joined us. Hello. Uh, we're just jumping over to a question now where I would like to hear from everyone. What does it look like to build collaborative relationships with other organizations? So what are some things that you have done that have worked or uh, things that you would recommend? Uh, feel free to respond in the chat box or come off of mute. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. My name is uh, Reverend Herman Hawkins, and I'm starting a new nonprofit in Vancouver, Washington. And so uh, I've done youth ministry for a lot of years, um, and I pastored in several congregations too. I've actually been a pastor 38 years all around the country and out of the country too. But um, as I start this new nonprofit, we're working with at-risk youth, homeless, and BIPOC. Or is everyone familiar with that lingo? Yeah, BIPOC or BIPOC communities. Correct. I just don't want to repeat myself. I've been a pastor a lot of years and I start my days at three in the morning. So I jumped in because this looks very helpful as I'm now 63 and starting a new ministry. So <laughs> I'm energy challenged some days and I got two proposals in front of me. So I do a lot of collaboration. Um, we have five board of directors and then I have probably 25, including three legal people, two attorneys and a judge who advise our board. Because a lot of times people of color do not experience inclusion. We do not experience equity or equality. And not everybody likes celebrating diversity in the Northwest. There's a nice polite way to say that. So, they want a pastor with my kind of miles on the years of ministry to help lead it. And so I always have to collaborate because I am African-American. 
I also have a last name that came from a British family in my ancestry, which means I also have some Native American because I was born in Portland. So collaboration is the name of the game for most Black people I know born in Portland. You have to collaborate because there are spiritual forces that might end your life or put you incarcerated or what other means of sometimes they do. So that's my story and you feel free to ask any questions, but I really appreciate being here. Thank you for letting me talk. Yes, and thank you for joining us. I think it's a really good illustration of you know, how community leaders are built and how you know, <laughs> okay, like, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, everywhere everywhere I've ever lived, you know, or the work that I've done, there's poignant people where everybody seems to kind of know their name or oh, connect with this person if you're looking for this. And I think it's that consistency that over the time and Correct. like you're saying, that willingness to just build relationships over and over again yeah. with everyone. Yeah. Thank right. you for sharing. I think that it mm -hmm. really helps to just illustrate, you know, mm -hmm. some of the consistency there as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to mute myself because I'm laying down and I don't want you guys to see my old body laying down on my bed. <laughs> That's fair. Okay. Thank you. And then I have here in the chat box, we have Chris um, says, I haven't necessarily seen stories as a part of um, asset and community mapping before. And I would be interested in hearing an example of that if you have one to share. Um, well, something that I have a couple of things that come to my mind. Um, something that I was pretty impressed with is I, when we had a youth coordinator who started their new position and um, you know how sometimes that works, maybe there's not a ton of work for someone to do within their first two weeks. This person um, took it upon themselves to start building a community asset map for our program. So within the first week, they're calling, they're connecting, um, they're reaching out, and um, it was very successful for them. People, when this person started attending meetings, um, started to show up in different places, people were familiar, um, and I think it also helped this person kind of get a jump um, on the work. So building those collaborative relationships um, I think in that story looked like that. Me personally, I have had success, like I said before, building relationships, um, partnerships with the informal sector, um, you know, in terms of using space, right, at a church. Um, there's been different churches that I've partnered with. I've also received sponsorships, right, from the private sector for different events that our youth group has done. Um, so I think it really... Um, there's, I think there's a lot of different stories and I think the how of how folks are going about it um, looks a lot different, right? This can definitely be done in a one-on-one -on -one setting, right? For an individual to find their own resources, but it can also be done as a youth group, as a church group um, in building partnerships, building that community and connecting um, with more folks. Joshua, do you have an example of a time you did some of this? Um, community mapping that you would like to share? Yeah, so for community resource mapping, one way to that we that we utilized it was the fact that the organization that I worked with was the Federation of Families Mammy Day chapter, is there were tons of things that we could not do on our end. We weren't able to offer, for example, transit, like personal transit via our vehicles to transfer youth to one place to another. So we were able to find a local agency, an art agency that was nearby to their area that they had a van and they were absolutely able to transport youth. So in trade, we did is we made a partnership with them throughout the community where we would offer space and we would offer them a time slot where our youth would be able to meet up with them. They would be able to have essentially a satellite area to put on these art events and they were able to utilize that van to pick up their youth pick up our youth and meet in the same place right so it was through that outreach through knowing oh that organization over there they have a van and we offer similar programming and our mission and vision is about the same why not partner with them so that's just one example 
I think it's a really great one where it kind of talks about um, kind of the mutual give and take, right? Um, you want to be kind of aware of what you can also give back in that relationship um, as you're building it. Let's go on to this next question. We Oh, uh, Miranda, let's have you go next. Sorry, almost missed your hand there. No, you're good. Um, I was just going to say the only other thing that I would add kind of goes into what you were just talking about. But one thing that I feel like kind of took me a little while to figure out with like creating new um, like collaborative relationships is that instead of just what we were previously doing was sending like an email with a brief introduction, but then realizing that if in that introduction, we also requested an opportunity to meet, whether that's in person or via Zoom, and then kind of having an ask and how we like having an idea of how we would like to collaborate beforehand, I think has been really helpful because then instead of like meeting, telling each other about our organizations and then just never connecting again, when we've had those asks and ideas beforehand, we've been able to start that collaborative process and having like follow-up meetings and more interaction and just like one little thing that I've found to be kind of helpful. Yeah, definitely. It is an important, you know, addition to that. It's coming to the table with that ask. I think that's that's a great comment to add. We'll go to the next question we have here, um, which is how can youth and young adult providers um, and other helping professionals work together to identify resources and assets? So it's kind of a one-off situation here where we're, we get some time to sit down and talk about it. What does this look like in the day-to-day work. So we heard Miranda um, just barely talking about reaching out to connect with somebody, um, but and including that ask, right? What are some other ideas um, of ways we can work together to identify the resources um, and assets that exist in our community? I feel like I'm being a big mouth, but this is Herman again. Um, one of the things that I have experienced and been exposed to in different ministries that I've served in, especially with youth, is to go to their parents or grandparents and ask them where they work. Do they work in the community? Are they representing any kind of business or community that cares about the youth in the community? And oftentimes I have found they come back they will actually chaperone the group. And I, as a pastor, get to run down the street and do something else. And they will control the group and run with the group and serve with the group in the community because they're taking them to their workplace. They're introducing them. They're letting the youth get exposed. Sometimes the youth get jobs. The business gets new employees. It's a win, win, win. Win for the kingdom, win for the business, and win for the youth who gets a new job. So, uh, I think sometimes getting people to sit down, ask, and then listen to the answers, and then ask, how can we follow up on this? Um, people will tell you what you need to know to help them all feel good and succeed. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Okay. Just, uh -huh. just ask folks, really, what works best for them. Um, we also have Jill here in the comments mentioned that community cafes give opportunities to do some of this. You're right. Um, she mentions that uh, we have used some to identify community priorities and the network in the community that can support that. I think that that's really great to do um, and a, a great way to kind of continue the process. I think, you know, just being open to new programs too. You know, I think sometimes when you've been doing this work for a while, a new grant, a new program comes along. Um, and I think that we have the ability to um, affect the success of that, right? So if we're sharing um, those resources that come around that we might be skeptical of, uh, we might be on board, but not so sure about it. You know, it's taking that extra effort, that extra step to connect, to learn more about it for ourselves, but then to also share it um, in the hopes that, uh, that it will continue to grow um, that more people we're working with can identify those resources, can identify those assets. The last question we have here um, was what may Im impact the ability to collaborate? I think we all got over the online Zoom hump, 
through the pandemic, that used to be quite a struggle to meet um, online. And I think it impacted, and that still does to a certain degree, impact our ability to collaborate with each other. Um, what are some other things that just hinder our ability um, to successfully do this? Um, this is Jill. Um, broken trust within community um, because it's hard to um, bridge that if you are part of the system that broke the trust. Yep, it's so true. I think that's true in all relationships. And I really want to emphasize if we can help people to restore the broken trust, to help people leap out there again, have new hope, new faith, new opportunities to love one another. I believe in my old self, that'll help the world become a little better if they just will extend themselves sometimes with new people, new ideas, and a new opportunity to do it in a kind way versus emphasizing the negative past experience of hurts. Feelings tend, in my awareness of emotions, to lead us down a path of fear, which I define as false evidence appearing real. I try to implement my faith to overcome my fear. And I really emphasize this with other people because so many people are panic stricken, not just because of the pandemic. They've heard about shootings. They've heard about bullying in schools. If we can turn that around to opportunity and become a good listener, some of the hurts come out, then the healing happens, if that makes sense. Yeah, it definitely does. And I think that that's such a great addition to this, um, the conversation that we're having. Joshua, did you have something that you wanted to add as well? Yeah, I sure did. I just wanted to add quickly beforehand that both of the points that were just made um, talked about the impact in both directions, right? One being the breaking of trust and then the other being extending your way to try and impact and rebuild that trust. So it can, it, it's, it's omnidirectional when we're doing this. But another thing that might impact the ability to collaborate uh, kind of stems back to the example that I gave earlier. It just so happened that within our community, we had an organization that, right, they had the fan and everything, but more specifically, they also had a mission and vision that aligned with the work that we were doing. But it could have just as easily gone the other way, that their mission and vision was, say, exactly opposite to the work that we were doing. And something like that would make it very difficult to collaborate. It's so true. And I think, um, you know, looking at some of the restorative or ways to kind of repair um, when that trust has been broken, um, rather than to just ignore that there has been harm done, um, that there needs to be some effort, right, put into that. And so I really think that that's an important part of the, the conversation as well. Um, so thank you all. But we're going to go to the next slide just in the, the thought of time here. Perfect. Um, so this is just kind of a short slide here where, you know, let's make this actionable. So we're going to talk a little bit about engaging youth or engaging clients in mapping. And a little bit later, we're going to practice uh, creating a resource map if we do have um, enough time. I'm thinking that we will. Um, so I'll go to the next slide now. Perfect. So the why. Involving young people in research and evaluation improves the quality and relevance of both research and ultimately the programs, the policies, and organizations that serve young people. It also helps youth to develop skills that they'll need to thrive as contributing adults. This is a quote that's from the UCLA Center for Developing Adolescents. Um, and this is kind of just, you know, the why. Why do we sit down and um, involve youth and involve clients? Because it's, 
you know, real time feedback, right? It's hearing from those that we serve. Um, I have a note here um, that talks just briefly about when you're identifying resources, make sure that you're identifying the resources that someone is interested in, um, not that you are interested in. And it just made me kind of think of a funny um, story when I was working with a young adult who had been uh, signed up for equestrian or horse therapy, and she did not like horses. And so I just thought that that was kind of a poignant example, right, of why it's important to listen to what someone is interested in, in terms of resources, in terms of how they want to spend their time. Um, let me see here. I think my next slide I will pass back to Joshua. Yes, that is exactly correct. And the next slide, I think it should be on now. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about is working together. And we have a, a chart to dis describe that, to illustrate that. So I'm gonna see if I can annotate this with a spotlight. Okay, yes. So what we're looking at is a way to see how we access or take in new information. So that influencing line that you see right here where the laser pointer is moving indicates how much information you are putting out. And that is to say the things that you are saying, doing, whatever, what is moving the community? What are you teaching other people? What people are you affecting? All of that. Whereas the learning line on the bottom there indicates how much information you are taking in. Now, all of these boxes serve a purpose depending on the situation. It's important to think about what lens you want to have on. If you're coming from that telling place, you may have a lot of influence. You may be teaching someone something or giving them access to new information, but you're not taking in any information or learning yourself. Again, useful, and important in some in some situations, not so important in other situations. If you're coming from this observing place, you may just be acting as kind of a fly on the wall, right? Not contributing, not asking questions, but taking in what you can on a surface level, maybe even withdrawing and not taking things in. So from this space, you wouldn't have a lot of influence and you most likely wouldn't be taking a lot of information or learning much, right? So coming from an asking place, you are taking more of a learning rather than an influencing position. So you may be asking questions, clarifying where you're unclear on things, but you're not contributing anything back or offering any information yourself. So you'd be high on the learning scale, but low on the influencing scale. Make sense, uh, make sense if you're in a training, although we try to engage you all as experts in your own ways and invite your knowledge and experience, but maybe as a student or taking some sort of course, uh, that could be a good place to come from. And finally, we have generating ideas on the top right there. If you are coming from that generating idea place, you are both equally a uh, highly influencing and learning or taking in and putting out new information. As a leader, it can be important to come from each of these places, but you're going to have the most impact by being in this generating ideas space. This involves collaborative, remember we're talking about collaboration with your community, collaborative discussion and partnership with others. It involves a mutual give and take, a back and forth conversation and giving and receiving information. Um, I hope that that makes sense to everyone. If it doesn't make any sense, please feel free to ask any questions. But this is really great when you're thinking about working, if you're doing an individual map, thinking about working together with the people on that list or even with yourself, I guess, or if you're doing the community resource map, thinking about how you're going to initiate these conversations with partners, other organizations, et cetera. Ready? I don't hear any questions. I don't see any questions. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. And we just wanted to give 
a definition of youth engagement because that's the name of the game uh, with, with what we're working on here, what we're wanting to do. Youth engagement is a strategy in which youth are given meaningful voice and role and are authentically involved in working towards changing the systems that directly affect their lives. And you can see that little chart on the right-hand side. I, oh, there we go, oh, trying to get my spotlight, here we go. You can see this chart on the right-hand side, but I'm not gonna go too deeply into it, but what's important while you're thinking about this is the definition getting meaningful and authentically in there meaningful voice so not to just have their voice for fun or just to make sure that you hear them where we want to avoid things like tokenism and manipulation and we want to make sure that they are authentically involved having policy in place to get those youth voices heard and get feedback to them and accountability for the things that are done and the things that are not done and speaking of accountability we have another chart and this is the social discipline window. Let me see if I can get another little annotation for us. There we go, right? So where we would, th there's a spectrum that we, we're not gonna discuss too deeply, but it's a spectrum where we're working uh, for youth, we're working to youth, but what we wanna be is we wanna be working with youth. And we want to basically entirely avoid 100% of the time this neglectful section. So if you have, low accountability, low structures, low boundaries, and you have zero support or zero to no support, low, zero to low support, because that rhymes, you are being neglectful. You are not working for you. You are not doing anything that will be of any real use. But if you have tons of support and low accountability, you're being a little bit permissive. You're working for you, you're being permissive. But if you have very high accountability structure and boundaries and very low support, now you're being punitive. You're being punishing. You're working uh, to do something with youth. But if you can just strike that pose where you have high accountability, high structure, and high boundaries, tagged along with high encouragement and nature or support, you are now working with youth. You're being restorative, right? We talked about that broken trust earlier. A way to rebuild that trust is by working with people, with youth. And that is where we want to be on this social discipline window. Okay. So we're moving along fairly quickly, but there are ways to get youth participation in mapping. And these, these slides should be available to you after. You can try and, and Google them if anything, but the easiest way to determine where to start in your resource mapping is with youth who have the firsthand knowledge, who better to reach out to. And tools that can support youth engagement in resource asset mapping include what you see on screen. Youth Move National itself has a things to consider, which you can find on our website, youthmovenational.org specifically on resource mapping. But we also have an asset mapping youth toolkit. There's a youth for youth document and youth.gov as well. All of these links are on the slide decks, which you can receive and we can send them out in an email and post. But just keep in mind, resources are available to you. So it doesn't have to be you in a room locked in and trying to figure this out. Use what you have available. A part of the resource mapping is getting the resources to begin the resource mapping too in its own way. Okay. With all that being said, earlier we promised an activity. We promised a sneak peek, so to speak, into resource mapping. So I want to invite the group that's here with me to participate in this process. And this can be a little bit of a sneak peek into what this process can look like. So we're gonna be a small group. And in this small group, what we're gonna do is we're gonna identify a common need. We're gonna identify a goal for youth uh, in our community, or rather a goal that youth have shared in our community. It could be something like transportation, uh, more space for activities, or connection to different supportive services in the area. 
We're going to discuss various resources that we think could help uh, within our own community um, that will help the young person, right? Or will help in this case, right? The goal that we are trying or the, the problem or issue that we are trying to solve. And we're going to brainstorm together what might be available in each sector, right? So we're thinking about the youth need in this uh, spotlight here, the youth need in the center, and what can we pull from the private sector back to the youth? What can we pull from the nonprofit sector back to the youth, public back to the youth, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, um, I do have an example that we could use for this activity, but I would like if there is one to hear from the group if they have an example of a common need or goal for youth in, the, in their communities. This is Jill, safe place in crisis. Got it, right. So our common need at the moment is a safe place in crisis. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put our heads together and see if we can't find or think of some resources to meet that need, right? Safe place in crisis. So I'm just gonna leave a little bit of silence and anyone who wants to jump in absolutely can. The word sanctuary comes to me in the sense that buildings can be a safe place in crisis. Um, I had a young fellow who called me yesterday twice because he didn't feel safe. He was being bullied and his grandparent had already taken him out of school. And thanks that he had my number so I could talk to him about safety and whether I need to call the police and get police there to make sure he was safe. And so I think that is a very big need for a lot of the youth in our city. Got it, yeah. Thank you for jumping in. And that's a really good point, right? That a building can also be, or a sanctuary, right? In your case, building can be a safe place for a youth to have crisis. I know for me, as an example, something that's public and that can be considered a building can be, um, potentially be, a school. I remember back when I was in high school, um, I it probably wasn't the, the most amazing place to go, or the best place or most well suited place to go. But I had uh, a teacher whose classroom I felt really good in. She was a wonderful teacher, my favorite teacher, one of my favorite teachers ever. And I would simply just, if I were having some kind of crisis, I would go to her room and tell her that I didn't even need to speak with 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 that teacher, I would just sit down and pull out a book or some homework or just in silence. And that would be my space for that crisis. And I do see in the chat box uh, that Arctelos has shared, another, another popular place to be is the library. Absolutely, the library is a wonderful place to go. It's one of the few places you can go with absolutely zero expectation on sending, on spending any money. It is publicly funded, it's entirely free. They have access to internet, they have books. This could be a good place to go to learn something. And I see Joe adding uh, a nonprofit crisis center like Cafe Oasis. Beautiful, and Joe, if you don't mind, is that is that public, nonprofit, private? Could you fit that in one of these sectors? Um. In, oh, that's why I said nonprofit. Oh, oh I, I'm so sorry. I why? that was me. I'm bad at reading. <laughs> no, it's me. I um, I typed profit twice, so that would make it very confusing. <laughs> but I believe they're nonprofit. Got okay. wonderful. So yeah. So right. So we have two in public, and we have one now in nonprofit, like the uh. Cafe Oasis. Can we think of anything in the private sector or the informal sector to, to meet this need of a safe place to be in crisis? I know back in our day, recreation centers. And in our community, we have community centers that the state and the local municipalities put money together and they become a community center and neighborhood kids can go there sometimes when they want a safe place to hang out. Yeah, that's wonderful. And that is an informal setting, right? Amongst people like you, amongst community members, amongst peers that you can go to 
when you are in crisis. Absolutely, I could put that in formal. It could potentially also be public. Either way is absolutely fine. And I do want to recognize uh, in our chat box that Chris has added uh, uh, that a park, right? A public park could be a public place. And Jill adding the Boys and Girls Club, again, being an informal setting uh, or potentially public, can kind of go either way, but an informal setting to address that need. And another informal place, absolutely, Jill, thank you, can be, uh, to be informal, can potentially be a church. A church can be a safe place, right? Connecting with that spirituality, connecting amongst a group of people, like-minded individuals, whether that is at a church, at the Boys and Girls Club, at the Community Rec Center, all three can be fitted into that informal space. So, right, we're doing a great job. And this is when we're working with this, and this is an activity you can use amongst yourselves as well, for those who are either here or watching the recording, but this is what this process can look like. Oh, this place, oh, that place, oh. And if you include your youth in this, all the better. But we do still have one sector that is yet to be filled. So can we come up with anything that would fit under the private or for-profit sector for a safe place to be during crisis? Hey, Joshua, I don't I don't know about other folks' uh, uh, areas, but in mine, we have a uh, private-owned children's hospital and a few private-owned uh, mental health therapy clinics, and both of which offer free walk-in services uh, for youth uh, in, in crisis. So you have to ask around, you have to kind of find them, uh, but we definitely have those private orgs that offer that sort of like free uh, initial intake uh, uh, client receiving. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for jumping in and sharing. And what's great about lists like these, to your point saying, right, you don't know about anybody else's area, but something like that can be an idea because sometimes you don't know what you don't know. Like I, I, some people might not have thought of, oh, what about the private hospitals, children's hospitals or private places? Now with that idea being shared, say, you know, we have a small group here, it could be a large group. Not everyone can think of, oh, are there any places like that in my area? And that's what makes these community resource maps um, so powerful amongst the group and including the youth voice as well. So thank you for sharing. And I see Jill in the chat box saying, business foundations and philanthropic foundation. That's absolutely right. To give one of those a name is, I'm sure we're all familiar or have heard of Hilton, right? the Hilton Hotels. Uh, the Hilton Foundation, which is from a set, from the same you know people, Hilton, um, but they're essentially a separate entity of a similar name. And they do do, do do, they do work in youth sectors. They do work in the area that we're actually talking about. So maybe we can reach out to them and we can have a discussion around um, a topic for our area for potentially donation, things like that. That could be a nonprofit, but can also potentially come from the Hilton Hotels themselves, their private sector as well. They can donate a space, donate their one of their conference areas, lounge rooms, conference rooms, whatever, for you to be able to, you know, do their own things inside of, feel safe, play games, whatever it might be. So again, what we've just gone over in these, in just these few minutes, it's been maybe eight minutes, give or take. In just these areas, we managed to fill each bucket with at least one or two, and we can grow that exponentially with time because these can be a living document. These maps can grow and shift and change as our communities do. And I just want to 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 note that Joe added the Department of Labor. Uh, has youth-based funding as well as the Department of Agriculture, which would likely fall under public. Um, but yes, that's absolutely right. See how creative we can get when we just sit down for a few minutes and share amongst one another? That is the power of resource mapping at the individual level, but also at what we're doing now, the community level. So, Thank you very much, everyone, for, for jumping in and, and navigating this process. And I, oh, we even got another one, the Gate Foundation. 
being another foundation you can go to for to try and fulfill one of these needs. With that, for sake of time, I'm going to continue moving on. But again, thank you so much. And feel free to use this activity in your own communities. And this is just a, a little something that you can use to help uh, end a community resource mapping session, maybe begin a community resource mapping session. Um, but this is called the head. Oh, hold on. Let me get my annotation up. Sorry, my little laser, the head, heart, and feet activity. So maybe at the latter half, at the end of this community resource mapping area, you can ask these questions, the head, the heart, the feet. What have I learned, right? So amongst your group of staff and youth and everyone who happens to be there, we can ask, what have I learned? How do I feel about this? And then that last one, what action steps will I take? Because once we have these maps, it is then about putting them into action, utilizing the listed resources to actually get somewhere. And Jill, I'm glad you enjoyed that activity. I see your, your note in the, in the chat box. So real quick, we're just for time, do we have even one volunteer that maybe wants to just talk about what they've learned, how they feel, and what action steps they may or may not take? I really feel wonderful that, I'm sorry I came late, but I'd tell you, um, I've been to a lot of asset mapping conferences. This was by far the most intriguing, interesting, and I do want to use your bullets and slides. So please email me and I will put them to work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Awesome. Wonderful. Oh, I'm seeing something. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, we'd be absolutely happy to share our slide deck and our things. But with that, to move along just a touch here, we do have additional resources. Uh, some of them are the ones you saw earlier, but some of them um, are different, right? Creating a custom map in Google Maps with different points. This now provides a global positioning system that you can map walking trails to get or, or, or ways to walk there, to drive your car, bike paths, buses, right? You can get very creative. And of course, we have just a little guide there on creating a personal resource map. So again, I just want to thank everyone for being here, providing your feedback and learning and teaching um, with us. With that, please add us next time. If you like this presentation, you can feel free to follow us. You can go to our website, youthmovenational.org. We have a Facebook account, an Instagram account. We have a Twitter account. We have all sorts of social media. But with that, we very much appreciate you all. And we thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I learned a lot.